is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering the Wall of Storms, chapters 59 and 60. Battle of Zaffin Gulf, part one and part two. In these chapters, we bid farewell to Gin Mazzotti, who dies exactly as she would have wanted to die, taking down a substantial foe in hand-to-hand combat, and it is badass AF. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Kyle for commissioning this episode. I believe that Kyle is here in the chat. Greetings. Guys, these chapters are a lot, man. Damn. Uh, it, honestly, I, I I can't see from my end with the Kindle about the page division. But my average, you know book coverage podcast is meant to be 50 pages. And I can't see, Kyle, that these two chapters were 50 pages, but I also don't think the last chapters were 50 pages because that was much shorter. I listened to the audiobook for a good portion of this, and it was an hour and 50 minutes for these two chapters for the audiobook, whereas the chapters last week added up to like 50 minutes alone for both chapters. So it was an odd thing. But it felt like it went by really fast because so much happens. And Kyle says, yeah, I did have to fudge the numbers a little bit. I kind of figured that. But like when you have chapters that are this unequal in length, it can be a little bit tricky. Um, So we start off chapter 59 with the Liuku warriors uh, basically begging for blood and they are going up against a an enemy that they do not realize has spent the better part of a year investigating the biology of the creatures that they are riding. Essentially, the Garinifins are their transportation and their weapon. And I don't know that they even have any idea that that they collected the the carcasses of the ones that fell into the water. Um, But even if they did, I don't believe they would have dreamed what this crew comes up with was even possible. Um, So I love this so much because Defiro Miro is on the front lines here and knows that Gin Mazzotti is holding back on purpose. And this is a really wild moment. At first they go after the Garinifins with bows and arrows. Does not make any sort of impression as we knew it wouldn't. And that was part of the point. Um, each of the airships behind the obscuring silk screens had soldiers charged with targeting uh, with targeting their secret weapons to point at the closing beasts, but none of the captains gave the order to fire. Breaths held, everyone waited for the flag signal to come from Silk Modic Arrow. Hold it, Gin Mazzotti muttered. Hold it. Abruptly, Tan Vanaki tapped hard at the back of Corva's neck, and the great Garinifin swept her wings forward and hovered in place. Pecutenrio had suggested that, given her pregnancy, perhaps she could direct the battle from the safety of the deck of one of the city ships, but Tanvanaki had scoffed at the notion. Her pregnancy wasn't nearly so advanced as to hinder her freedom of movement, and she did not trust anyone else to lead the Garinifins to victory against these wily opponents. So, the Garinifins come and hover very close, and she has a sense. There's a trap here. Something's going on. So she comes forward very, very close and is trying to get them to set off this trap. 
it opens its jaws. Everybody is like, sure. Oh, my God, we're about to be drenched in fire. Gimazoti does not give the order. Fire does not come from its mouth. In the secret observation post, Thera pressed her hands against her mouth to prevent herself from screaming as the Grinifin almost kissed the airship before swerving away at the last minute without unleashing a tongue of flames. A volley of arrows shot out as the Garinifin raced away. Tan Vanaki let out a breath. Evidently, the Imperial's airship's anemic armament could be explained by a plan to target the riders rather than the beasts with nigh impenetrable skin. However, having observed the Dara proficiency with projectile weapons, the riders were ready for this tactic. All of them now wore armor made from thick layers of hide. Most of the arrows flew wide of the mark due to the powerful swirling current of air generated by the beast's massive wings. The few that did strike the riders fell off harmlessly. So it turns out, because Thera says to herself, what is the marshal thinking? And I was like, word? The marshal didn't even tell you what her plan was? Like, y'all came up with most of the tech for this. I would have thought she would have let you in on what her whole objective was here but evidently not um so they all have they're they're very well trained while people are kind of wondering what the hell are you doing they all know that they just have to wait for her orders um and we get we go back and sort of take a step away from the battle for a minute to learn about what they have found out regarding the Garinifins and the way that their teeth are made. So essentially, the cone that we had seen um, from the Tan Adu, Tan Adu, is that the dude? Is his name? Um, Kyle says yes. Thank you, Kyle. The cone that like is a fire starter is a very similar deal to how the Garinifins start fire with their teeth going through these sort of uh, cones at the bottoms of their jaws that exactly fit those teeth. And they eat a lot of grass and the particles that are stuck in there amongst their teeth um, begin to ferment and create a gas. And also the actual grass is still trapped and this all acts as kindling. Um, the result was extreme heat that set fire to the tinder in the tips of the canines. When the Garinifin opened its mouth and expelled a mixture of exhalation from its lungs and the flammable fermented gas from its internal sacs, the stream was lit, and that was the secret of the Garinifin's fire breath. So the point is that they have to be able to close their mouths in order to create that spark that lights the fire in the first place. And so what they do is they create these, there's a couple of things, but the, the biggest one to deal with this issue is they create these arrows that sort of unfold into caltrops in their mouths to prevent them from being able to close their mouths. And it hits the insides of their mouths. And one would think an arrow to the inside of the mouth is going to go up into the brain and kill. No, no, no. Apparently that is not how it works with the dragons in this universe. They can take that kind of abuse and pretty much not even feel it. And it's fine. So when they get hit in the mouth with some arrows, they just kind of shrug it off because they figure it's the same thing that they've dealt with before. And they're going to be able to like, just move right through it and probably like burn the arrows to bits once they set some fire going. But it turns out that they can't close their mouths to get that fire started because these things have opened and are keeping their mouth open. Um, honestly, this is genius. I love this so much. And it just reminds me of, because of, I have this facial twitch, I had to go and get imaging done and they had to like jam all of this uh, cotton wool and paper towel and um, bandage into my mouth to hold my mouth open for the imaging and it was just the weirdest feeling and just super annoying. And I can't imagine something like this that's like sharp and indented. It's like penetrated their actual flesh. 
And apparently some of the Lyuku, who are very daring, are like, well, fuck it. I'm going to get down there and I'm going to take this out. No, sir, you are not. The dragons are, they don't feel too much when they get shot. But once they try and close their mouths, it shoves it further in and that causes a lot of pain. And then when these dudes try and yank it out, that causes a ton of pain, which causes the Grinifins to shake their heads and their riders just get thrown off and fall to their deaths. So that's not super great. The other thing is they have created these silk modic arrows There is so much going on with these. So basically this is fired from a crossbow. Um, Really reminds me of like the Game of Thrones dealies to deal with the dragons that Cersei has made. But even though all of the riders, all of the Lyuku are aware, yeah, these probably will be able to get through the hide of the Garinifins. They aren't real worried about it because they have... They're, they're just so vast that you can hit them and it's not really going to be a debilitating blow. It certainly won't kill them unless you manage to strike them directly in the heart, which is most unlikely. So all of them are sort of kind of like not really worried about it and therefore making no particular effort to get out of range or avoid them. Well... First of all, these bolts go through the skin and into the flesh way more easily than anybody predicted. And we find out that they tipped all of the crossbow bolts with diamonds, which is wild. I love this. So what a crazy. Okay, I'm going to read this bit. Um. Empress Gia had emptied the imperial treasury in Pan to supply the marshal's workshops with enough diamonds to construct these bolts, each as expensive as a baron's castle. Yo, I really hope that, like, after this battle, they go around and collect those. I mean, shit, you know, that's just, like, laying out there. (sighs) Fuck. As the bolts ripped through the bodies of the Garinifins, they quickly lost energy and decelerated. The Garinifins howled in pain and shuddered, their motions jerky, and the riders on their backs hanging on for dear life. But as Tan Banaki had gambled, though the bolts injured the Garinifins, none of them managed to pierce the heart of a Garinifin, and the wounds would not be fatal. The struck Garinifins just had to curl their long serpentine necks around to pull the bolts out with their teeth. The bolts, having now lost most of their momentum, stopped penetrating any farther into the mass of beasts. The bamboo shafts flexed flexed, and something seemed to break inside them. At that moment, the Strek Garinifins felt a deep, powerful jolt inside their bodies, as though some giant hand had reached in, seized their innards, and given a forceful tug. It left them with a sa- strange sensation, not quite cold, not quite pain, but sort of a spreading numbness. Muffled explosions. Each of the struck Garinifins seemed to bulge just slightly. The Garinifins looked at their companions helplessly, their wings slowing down. And then just like that, the five struck Garinifins exploded, turning into five burning, bloody clouds. Flesh, bone, leather, viscera, gore rained down upon the Stunley Yuku warriors gazing up at this fantastical display. Yo! That is brutal! Look, I get that there are enemies and everything, but I feel so bad for these poor dragons. They didn't ask to be a part of this man. You know... This is just a thing that they've been bred to do. It feels so like, I feel so like I am not, I do not blame the people of Dara at all. Of course, like they, this is what you've got to do. But it feels like people who do dog fighting and the dogs getting put down, you know, it's just like, 
it just makes me so sad because these creatures are just doing what they have been told told to do. And I hate seeing them having to suffer the way that they do in this section. It is rough. Um, so we find out exactly how this worked. Each of the hollow bamboo shafts held an oge jar inside, just behind the diamond enhanced tip. Made of the thinnest glass coated with silver inside and out, the jars were intended to present the largest possible channeling surfaces to hold silkmotic power. To imbue the embedded oje jars with as much silkmotic force as possible, Mizakroon designed a massive silkmotic generator whose centerpiece was a disk of glass about 10 feet across. This was probably the largest piece of glass ever created in the history of Dara, and the best glass workers of the islands had to make multiple attempts and deal with many cracked and broken prototypes before succeeding. The disc was fixed upon an axis of ironwood and spun by a system of belts and gears powered by windmills. Rubbers made of thick layers of silk wound tightly were then pressed against the glass to generate the silkmotic force, which was channeled by thick silver chains into the oje jars. Once the bolts penetrated the thick bodies of the grinifins, the bamboo bolts flexed and bent until the oje jars broke, causing the silkmotic force to discharge. So we get then some information about the testing of trying to create a strong enough jolt that they can stop the heart of an animal the size of a grinifin. And they start experimenting with different again feeling very sad for the animals but what can you do they try it with chickens they try it with sheep and it turns out that zomi kidosu is able to figure out how to do this right behind the oje jar in each bolt the hollow cane of the bamboo was packed with firework powder one of the most visually impressive effects of a silkmotic discharge was the lightning-like spark it generated. This spark, the two engineers realized, could be used to set off an explosion. Well, shit. So, this is how, like, the, the spark comes from the thing breaking. There's basically fireworks stuffed in right behind it. And... That's all it takes because these creatures are stuffed with fucking flammable gas. And it says uh, the Garinifins were simply thick layers of flesh wrapped around flammable bags of fermented gas. If the explosion caused by the discharge of the OJ jar could be channeled to the gas sacks. That was why the silkmotic arrows were also made with hollow tips and packed with thin nails that upon the explosion of the firework powder would burrow hundreds of channels into the viscera of the struck Garinifin, maximizing the chance that one of the internal gas sacs would be breached to begin a chain reaction of fiery explosions inside their bodies. <sighs> Honestly, guys, this is so brutal. Like, this is just deeply disturbing. When you really step back and look at it, it is fucked up. It works like a charm. Don't get me wrong. This is pure genius what they have figured out, this like whole chain reaction. But d -d -d damn, that's cold blooded. So <laughs> this, this, go, we go back to Tom Benaki, who is watching this fucking display and doesn't know what to think. And she's about to be like, okay, we got to get the fuck out of here. What? This is a retreat, obviously. And then she hears the horn and she looks down and she sees her dad and she, it says, even in the crowd, she picked out the eyes of her father. Uh, the piercing bone trumpet blared from the deck. It was the call for the Garinifin riders to press their assault regardless of cost. Wherever I point, you must attack. Tom Vanaki sighed, pressed her speaking tube into Corva's neck and ordered another assault. But once again, she told Corva to hang back. So everybody is expecting, everybody from Dara, except for Ginma Zoti, that is, is expecting that as soon as they see this has happened, 
the Liuku are going to back the fuck off, which nearly was what happened. But because of this order from the horn, they don't. And Gin Mizoti is the only one who sort of foresaw that the smartest way to handle this unexpected turn of events is to continue to press. It says the machinery for launching the silk model the silkmotic bolts was so cumbersome that reloading the crossbow would take some time. The lull right after a volley of bolts was the perfect time to attack when the airships would be defenseless. But the marshal had one more trick up her sleeves. Gaggers get into positions. So here comes the thing with the fucking caltrops that open inside their mouths. This is so, Oh my God. Oh, um, they're, it's basically like they've been sort of like, uh, neutered, you know? Um, so yeah, we see some of them climbing up and trying to rip them out. Tampanaki decided she could not afford to wait. Even if the riders succeeded in removing the caltrops, which seemed unlikely and would take time, the airships would take advantage of the delay to rearm themselves. She could see the airship crews were already hurrying to winch back their gigantic crossbows and reload them. So she gives the order to Corva to use talons, which is something that evidently in the kind of warfare that they level, that is almost an unheard of order. At, usually it's talons and claws at the very least. And even then only in totally desperate circumstances when every other like their strength has given out. They have no more fire breath left. And now it's just talons, which is really like bottom of the barrel. We're scraping here. Um, so the airship crew trying to work faster at winching back the crossbow, the pilot of the Garinifin whistled sharply and the other riders on the back let loose a barrage of hard round stones with their slingshots. Several of the crossbowers fell down, their skulls crushed by the missiles. Another screamed as her left arm hung uselessly, broken. Excuse me. A few women emerged from the hull to take the place of their fallen and injured comrades, and more arrows flew from the arrow slits, but most bounced harmlessly off the rider's tough leather armor. Now, the pilot shouted into the speaking tube, pressed against her mount's neck. She and the rest of her crew braced themselves against the harness and atop the saddles as the Garinifins reared up, her powerful wings generating a wild, turbulent storm, and reached out with her left claw, slashing the sharp talons across the billowing hull of the spirit of Kiji. So everything begins to be laid open by this attack. However, again, Ginmazoti has thought of this eventuality. And it turns out that they can charge the frames of the ships with electricity also. And they do this. And so some of them are killed in midair as they are ripping ships apart because they touch the frame that's electrified. Honestly, this is so genius. I love it so much. I love it so much. Um, and I'm trying to find the exact spot where this happens. Let's see. Um, oh, right. Okay. So Mota uh, Kifi is a character who gets introduced right before he's killed here. And he is ex an extraordinarily strong dude. And even though he's rather heavy in comparison to a lot of the women that are on board, because he is so strong, he's very valuable in being able to uh, winch back the crossbows. And he asks his captain as they are about to like let one last one loose, Captain Atamu, whether or not they will remember him and his crew the way they remember the hegemon. And his captain is rather harsh. And rather than just tell him, yes, because this dude's about to die and why not just lie? She tells him, probably not. Most soldiers who die are quickly forgotten, but we don't fight to leave a name. We fight because it's the right thing to do. And 
he says that he was hoping to be in a song and she says not all heroes need songs composed about them it's enough that we know who we are and dude i get that that's a real noble sentiment but really let the guy have a fucking thing right before he dies just go ahead let him have this christ um so the bolt leaped from the crossbow, traced a gentle arc through the air that ended in the body of the tan and green striped Garinifin. A loud moan, then the sky was lit up with another fiery explosion. The rest of the Garinifins, now recovered somewhat from the pain of the caltrops stuck in their mouths, approached and took out their anger by swiping their sharp talons at individual crew members, ripping some cleanly in half and crushing others into bloody meat pies before tossing them into the ocean. <sighs> These things are no joke. Um, so I'm trying to find the the next because I'm, there's so much that happens with this battle, and I'm just trying to hit some of the like major, you know, high impact points. Um, mm -mm -mm. Deprived of the structural support of the silk skin, the frameworks wobbled and flexed even more, as though about to come apart at any moment. What are they playing at? Tanvanaki wondered. Um, she she held Korva back and watched as the other Garinifins approached the rippling skeletal airships, which now looked like bird cages holding clusters of eggs. Flaps of Garinifin hide taken from the dissected carcasses cradled the vulnerable gas bags, apparently an attempt at some shielding against the Garinifin fire breath. Incredibly, the soldiers aboard the airships stopped winching their giant crossbows. Instead, they retreated into the interior of the cage-like hull, where, working in small teams, they assembled segments of bamboo into long lances 50 feet in length tipped with bronze. Then, dividing into two columns, they raised the lances into the air and braced themselves inside the cage along two major structural members of the hulls, like two walkways. Two lances pointed forward and two lances pointed at the back. And this is like Tom Vanaki assumes that they are trying to use these long poles as lances. And it says Mazzotti glanced at the thin silvery wires attached to the bronze tips of the long lances and seemed to hear deep in her heart, the humming of the power beneath her feet. So, they thrust the lance through the lattice of the hull. Uh, it, the Grinifin grabs the tip of the lance and shoves it aside. Though its eyes were still blocked by the bamboo caltrop, its eyes seemed to curve into a cruel smile. The giant lance wielded by the puny humans was no match for its reflexes and strength. The Grinifin reached out with its other claw. Once it grabbed the two lances, it intended to drag the humans from their gondola like ants crawling along some branch and toss them to the roiling ocean below. The claw closed on the lance. The Garinifin shuddered. So basically, the Garinifin is a closed circuit. Some unseen force coursed through its limbs and the entire hovering body convulsed in the air. The riders on the Garinifin felt the same jolt. It was an indescribable sensation, as though some giant skewer had pierced their bodies in an instant and frozen all their muscle. Time, once again, slowed down. The Garinifin tried to let go of the lance and found that it could not. Sucks to suck! So, finally, it lets go and just drops into the water dead. And... Then we go to chapter 60 and we have stepped back again from the battle and we are with Zomi and Thera who are on a hike. And what it turns out they're doing is experimenting here with collecting electricity by using lightning. And the reason that they have finally figured out that lightning and silkmotic force are the same thing is because Zomi is getting uh, electroshock therapy for her leg. And when she gets the first treatment, she rec recognizes the sensation and is like, oh my God, this is exactly what it felt like, except this is like a way more dialed back version. 
this is exactly what it was like when I got struck in the first place. This is the same shit, I guarantee. So they are going, they, they've been like trying to generate enough power, but like being able to store that much is really, really tricky. And so we have this whole thing with um, Misa Kroon, who is trying to create a big enough jar, but everything that is big enough to hold this much power is too delicate. And so he's given the suggestion about what about making like several jars that are connected they aren't, they are not one large, extremely uh, fragile thing. They have a bit more strength to them because they are segmented, basically. Um, the spark could stretch across a longer gap between the two channeling rods, but when he connected the jars side by side, the reservoir formed by the collection of jars generated a thicker spark, though it could not leap across as wide a gap. In other words, when the jars connected in parallel, the silkmotic force seemed to have more quantity, though it wasn't as intense. Um, a large reservoir of OJ jars generated a shock powerful enough to kill a sheep or calf, though the channeling rods had to be held in such a way that the silkmotic current flowed right through the heart of the animal. I feel so bad. I really do, guys. Um... What they needed was a source of silkmotic power that would be strong enough to kill a gorinifin in a single jolt and a reservoir to hold such power that wasn't so bulky or fragile as glass or porcelain ogre jars. So this is Zomi and Thera, and they are up on this mountain that is extremely dangerous during thunderstorms because they and they know that because there are so many trees that have been like cleft into pieces or have scarring on them from being hit by lightning. Um, so on the ground, they had erected two winches and at the bottom of the string, an iron chain dangled into a large OJ jar. They stood some distance away. Um, Thera prays to Lord Kiji and the sky darkened as though someone had banked the fire of the sun. The world seemed to grow smaller while heaven and earth pressed closer to each other. The very air was charged with invisible lines of power. Heavy drops of rain fell. Thera and Zomi huddled under a flat, low canopy set up next to the second winch. Uh, the sparks, the, the, there was a strike there are sparks heading down into the OJ jar. They're watching this and they're like, holy shit, no way it's actually working. And then they see this stag that comes leaping out of the woods. The stag stopped by the side of the OJ jar, bent, uh, placed one foot against the outside, and then bent down as though to give the still crackling chain a kiss. And a giant spark, almost two feet long, leapt from the top of the jar, striking the stag in the head. The long spark was like a flower made of fire, a spider web woven from luminous ether, a river with tributaries filled with star matter. Zomi and Thera closed their eyes. The light was brighter than the glow of a thousand suns, and they could not gaze upon the power of the gods without being blinded. When they opened their eyes again, the stag was gone and only a smoking patch of ashes in the grass next to the Oje jar in the shape of the stag convinced them it had not been a dream. Thank you, Lord Fithaweo, the women whispered, knowing that they had seen a sign. They had succeeded in bottling lightning, in capturing the power of the gods. So that is pretty dope. Um, so then we get an interesting sort of aside here. We hear about how they're working to uh, make these reservoirs big enough. And we hear about how Empress Gia is opening up all of the coffers and all of the treasury in order to give them the adequate equipment. But there are some people who are taking advantage of this, as they do. And this is one of those things that, like, I just deeply understand. You can say as much as you want that, like, stealing is wrong. But if you know your entire life could be improved and that you could improve the lives of other people, 
by just taking this one enormous gem that is sitting in front of you right here that nobody seems to be noticing. It's a real, like, I remember when I worked at the bank and I would count up my drawer at the end of the day. And there were times where I would have like, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 in my drawer. And I couldn't help but think that for me, this is life changing money. That's the, like, I would be able to almost completely pay off my student loan debt. And just my, uh, there's so much that I could do. And I was never actually tempted to take it because there are so many like ways that that bites you in the ass far apart from just like, you know, being nailed for theft and everything. There's just so many ways that that goes wrong, but it's impossible to not think about what if I took this in the abstract when you're holding it in your hand, you know? So I really understand the temptation, but obviously these people got a little bit carried away. So there's sort of like, there's a description about how the servants who are allowed into the treasury are forced to wear really form fitting clothing and carry trays that can't have secret compartments because they're so thin and all of these different like security measures. It's basically like, you know, the women who are packing drugs and they are meant to do all of the packing in their underwear so that they can't steal any product and, and walk off with it. Um, and these dudes steal jewels and gold nuggets and shove them up their ass. And there is this fucking, this paragraph, guys, one of the men simply stuffed too much into himself. And after an unwise choice of a large meal of stewed cabbage the night before, he gave up the secret in an explosive confession before he could get to the toilet. Dislike. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. Um, the scandal. Oh, sorry. Kyle says this kid has popped up a couple times before he was part of those two shitty guys rebellion. Oh, the one who stole. I'm wondering if I missed this comment from earlier or if you're talking about this dude right here. Um, the scandal, however, provide music crew, provided music croon and the mathematical key to Thu and inspiration. Um, oh, Kyle says Mota, the muscle guy that died. Oh, was he the guy that Zomi said how strong he was when she met him or somebody said, okay, cool. Um, so, they realize that uh, a jar, when reduced to, its es- reduced to its essence, was nothing more than two surfaces made of channeling material separated by a thin layer of damming material. It could be in the shape of a jar, a plate, a bulb, or anything else, such as a long, flexible tube that could be twisted and coiled to take up as little space as possible. They basically come up with a power line here. Um... And they figure out how to coat the inside of these tubes very easily with super, super thin layers of metal by getting involved in the criminal underbelly. I really enjoy this. Um, Ring Coda gets together with some of his like farseers and goes and finds some of the best forgers in Dara and has them come by and have dinner with the scholars. And I love this, the way that this goes so bad. Um, Atharo Ye raises his cup and says, I'm certain that had each of you been born to the scholarly families, you would all have achieved the rank of Firoa. And a bunch of them are really offended by this. But Gozoji, who is one of the leaders, realizes that he is trying to pay a compliment. And she says to him, I am certain that had you been born to one of our families, you would have been an inventive and an, an, an adroit forger. And Atharo Ye says, do you really think so? And blushes. There's so many interesting engineering problems in your field. I was thinking of an idea for how to make soapstone appear as Jade, and I wanted to get your opinion on it. And all of the thieves suddenly realize, like, this dude is 
absolutely, totally sincere. He's not trying to be a dick. He genuinely admires what we're doing and is interested. And they all just chill. All of a sudden, they're like, oh, okay, this guy's not so bad. <laughs> and I really loved this moment so, so much. Um, so it says they could turn a crude wooden carving into a simulacrum of the most precious artifacts made by ancient goldsmiths. And now they were charged with helping the marshals devise a way to coat the garinifin intestines with gold without destroying any of their thin membranes. They came up with the following solution. Quicksilver was used to wash the inside and outside of the intestines to coat the surface with a thin layer of mercury. Next, an amalgam of gold and mercury was made by heating the mercury and stirring in flakes of gold to saturation. Now, listen, all of these people are dead now of mercury poisoning. What can you do? But this is how it had to work. The resulting amalgam, like molasses, was squeezed through the interior of the intestines and used to soak the outside until a layer coated the surfaces easily, and then the intestines were brought to a gentle heat to boil away the mercury, leaving a thin, smooth surface of gold to coat the inside and outside walls. The intestines were then cut into six long segments and coiled up, long oje jars with the capacity of arrays of innumerable Regular OJ jars connected in parallel, but small enough to be stored inside ceramic spheres dangling from airships as ballast. So that's what those balls of ballast were that were ceramic hanging from the front of the thing that looked like a giant pearl. After they were charged in thunderstorms with the power of lightning, the coiled up intestines were then coated in a layer of wax to further help isolate and preserve the dammed up sigmatic force. Wires could be poked through to connect the inner and outer surfaces and draw out the Rapa or Kana variety of the force without a disastrous discharge until the moment it was needed. So that is really, really wild. I just enjoy that we get to see them use these tools, but then we get a bit, a bit of like behind the scenes on exactly how this works. This author has really thought all of this stuff through and or maybe a lot of it is based on things that actually existed. I don't know anything about the history of like electric discovery. I genuinely have no clue. So for all I know, some of this is actually based on how things were discovered. Um, so Tom Vanaki is looking around realizing there are only six of these Garinifins left. And she's just like, motherfucker, I do not know what to do. And she gives the order for a retreat. And all of the Dara ships begin to give chase and Gin Mizoti realizes a little bit too late that this is a trap to pull all of them far apart from one another so that they don't have any support. Um, all of a sudden the five escaping Garinifin sped up and swerved away. They looped up and around and all five converged upon heart of Tututika. Um, by pretending to retreat, she managed to pull them apart, and now she could concentrate her forces on a single Imperial airship and regain the advantage of numbers. Uh, they ripped up enough gas bags um, that the heart of Tututika began losing altitude. Tom Banaki called for them to pull back and focus on a different airship. As the panicked crew on the sinking heart of Tututika scrambled to save their doomed ship, the Silkmonic lances were brought close to each other and a long spark arced across their tips. There was a massive explosion as the leaking gas bags caught fire. The fiery wreckage of the airship slowly drifted down to the sea, all hands lost. Um, and this is where Gin Mazoti yells for all of them to charge the frame. Um, and then we have the deaths of, I think, all the other Garinifins until Tamanaki is literally the last one left. Um, the sea bobbed with the carcasses of Garinifins who had died from lightning strikes and the smoking remains of those who had exploded from silkmotic arrows. Yep. Of the 20 who had accompanied the invasion force, only Korva was left in the air. And we cut then to fucking Doro Solofi and Nota Me. These motherfuckers. Now, I shouldn't say these motherfuckers because there's only really one motherfucker. Nota Me is 
uh, I'm trying to find the exact spot where they have this conversation. Here it is. No to me is the one that is the actual motherfucker. Um, and Doru is essentially like really just grateful that they weren't executed for beginning this, uh, the, from the beginning of the book, the rebellion that was sort of low key funded by Gia. I can't remember how this plays out right here. Is there going to be a time when Gia finds out it was one of these dudes who basically betrayed them all? Because I know that Gia is aware that what she did hasn't worked out for her. But I kind of want her to know what she had a hand in. Because if this guy hadn't gotten as far as he had with the rebellion because of her help, I don't know that he would have pulled this shit. I feel like there she holds some of the responsibility for what he chose to do here. Um, But anyway, Doru is like, I'm really glad that he didn't execute us. Let's prove ourselves and maybe they will get our they will give us a little bit more land. And no to me is like, dude, didn't you want to be a king again? What the fuck? And Doru is like, what do you mean? We don't have a lot of choices here, buddy. We're lucky we didn't get our fucking heads cut off. And Noda is like, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but we're fighting a war and the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And Doru is like, whoa, dude, I don't think I can do this. I just, no, I'm sorry. I'm just glad to have my head still on. And Noda me is like, mm, but do you? And fucking kills Doru Salofi. <sighs> I hated it. I felt so bad. I hated it so much. So this is when the Lyuku get their unexpected advantage because it turns out that Noda Mi is going to blow a bunch of shit up. I hate this so much. I hate everything about it. The way that it's timed because it's just when it really looks like Dara, they are just going to win it. That's it no problem. And he just waits until this moment. I hate that he's doing this with this understanding that if we hand them a victory, the Lyuku are just going to be so grateful to us. It's just so precious how little he understands. Like you betrayed your own people. Do you think that's going to get you respect from them? That's not how this works. They are going to take the advantage that you gave them and then they are going to kill you and say, hey, thanks for that. Bye. And just they don't care about you. They know that you are just a betrayer. It's going to be the same as the fucking dude in the first book who like tried to sabotage the young king and thought that he could keep sabotaging from behind the scenes. And then when the rebellion inevitably reached their doorstep, he could just explain, no, 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 I was really on your side the whole time. And they would all listen to him. That's not how this works, guys. Come on. But he really seems to think that this is going to like, no, dude, shut up. Have you seen how the Lyuku operate? Whatever gave you the idea that they have any interest in like working with your people? That's not how, any attempt that they make to give the appearance that that's what they want is a manipulation. That's pure. Like if you're falling for that, then you're just such a moron. And we know he is such a moron, but like Jesus Christ. Um, so her heart almost leapt out of her throat as she saw the Imperial airships explode one after the other. <sighs> I hate this so much. It's because of flame arrows, which the Lyuku do not use. And so the way that they built these ships depended on the fact that they do not use fire arrows because these would have been incredibly easy targets if they did. And that is exactly how he has his people take them down. And poor Gin Mazoti realizing that they fucking betrayed her. She just doesn't even know. Like, she is just flipping out as you would. Oh, my God. Are you kidding me? I would be levitating with rage. Like, forget it. 
Um, so she tell the her ship is like going down. Defira Miro is yelling that we we have to abandon ship. If we abandon ship, there will be no stopping the Lyuku. She looked bes- behind her and saw the confusion among the Dara fleet. Notami had managed to have his followers infiltrate many ships in the auxiliary fleet as well as the Imperial Navy during the last few months. By now, they had established control over a significant portion of the vessels, executing confused officers, sailors, and marines who couldn't understand why their own ships were firing on the marshal. To be sure, Notami's people weren't able to control all the support ships or the warships of the Imperial Navy, and Thankarukono tried to rally those still loyal to the marshal to respond. But he was hampered by the fact that he couldn't tell which ships he could trust. Deprived of central leadership's leadership, ships still loyal to the marshal milled about in confusion, and Noda's ships began to systemically surround them, breaking their oars, ramming them, and demanding their surrender. Oh, God. I hate this so much. So she gets up and she addresses her crew. And basically tells everybody, we got to fucking kill this king. Look, we might survive if we abandon ship, but Dara will ultimately be lost. So I'm going to go after him. If you guys don't want to follow me, I get it completely. I'm not asking you to, but I'm going to go after this motherfucker. And nobody at all decides to stay behind. Everybody's like, uh, yeah, we are absolutely going to come and die with you. What are you kidding me? And she says, I never had any doubt. Um, so following the example of the marshal, each of the other sinking airships picked a city ship and the crew struggled to steer toward their targets. The fire singed the hair of the crew and blisters and boils appeared on their skin as the bamboo and steel frame popped and broke apart around them. As the flaming silk modic arrow crashed towards the Pecu's flagship, the heat from the airship washed over the deck like a tsunami wave. Many of the Lyuku warriors dove over the sides, certain that staying meant death, but Pecu Tenryo, wearing a helmet made from the skull of a yearling Garinifin, stood steadfast on the deck. Because, of course he did. Because that's just, he's just like that. Come on. So... Peku Tenryo basically scythes his way through practically everybody until it's just Gin Mazzotti and Defiro Miro. And I love how this goes down because Peku is like trying to fucking poke and prod at Gin Mazzotti's honor. Uh, and meanwhile, Zomi, who is off to one side, has noticed this fight and she decides that she is going to get involved. So it was clear that the Peku's strength was the greater and now Rowena was far too heavy for the marshal to wield effectively. Defiro Miro stumbled a few times under the heavy blows as sparks flew from, from simplicity and biter. How much longer could the marshal and captain last? Defiro's movements became sluggish and slow. Do you remember how we overcame Kindo Marana? asked Gin Mazzotti. Defiro recalled the surprise attack on Rui at the beginning of the Chrysanthemum Dandelion War, when the marshal had assigned him a most dangerous mission. He smiled at Gin. Of course. So this is when Peku comes forward, swings at Defiro's head, Defiro manages to block the main force of it, but Gin Mazzotti does not step forward to help him. And Pecu Tenryo is like, oh shit, look at Gin Mazzotti over here chilling while you're about to die and she's not even trying to fight me. You have wasted your life to save someone who runs away from the battle. And Defiro just doesn't say anything and is still trying to hold him back. As he backed off one more step, Defiro's back leg buckled, and with two mighty swings of Lengi... L- Lengi... Boto? Hmm. I'm not sure. I don't think I've come across the name of this sword before. Um, Tenryo knocked Defiro's weapons out of his hands. The Peku raised the axe, bloodless, curling his lips into a wild grin. 
Defiro cried out and leapt at Peku Tenryo, meeting the oncoming blow of the war axe with his chest. <sighs> Takes a certain kind, I guess. Blood erupted from his mouth. The two collapsed to the deck in a heap, with Defiro on top. Ginmazoti dashed forward and, with a mighty roar, plunged Na Aroena through the back of Defiro Miro and into the chest of Peku Tenryo. Tenryo sensed the coming thrust and managed to shift slightly to the side. The sword tip sank into his breast, but did not pierce his heart. <sighs> Do you know how irritated I was when I read that? Do you know how irritated I was when I read that? <clears throat> so Peku is like, well, you got him to sacrifice his life. Too bad that didn't fucking do anything. He lifted up the body until he had enough room to bend his legs and brace his feet against Defiro's chest. Gin watched with a sinking heart as she braced herself against the sword, trying to pin the Peku to the deck, but Defiro's body slid inexorably up the sword. He was going to kick him off along with the marshal. This is one of those moments where I want her to do the like John Wick thing where he smacks the top of the knife. You know what I'm talking about? With one hand. <laughs> um, Gin looked up and she saw Zomi holding the broken shaft of a silkmotic arrow. The firework powder in the shaft had leaked out. And Gin just knows that what Zomi is going to try and do here is going to end in her death as well. But she's like, that's what it's going to take. That's what it's going to fucking take. So Zomi shoves the bolt into Gin's belly and the jar discharges its, its electricity and goes right through the sword and stops the Peku's heart immediately. And Zomi's alive for just a minute more and asks if he's dead. And Zomi says yes, and the marshal just says good. And then she closes her eyes. And Zomi tries to wake her up. And Gin says stop, stop, stop. And then her face relaxes and she just dies. And Zomi has to do this awful thing after this because she knows that everybody is like where is Gin what has happened they need leadership right now and so she strings Gin's body up and using the electricity makes it look like she's moving and waving the flag back and forth and everybody sees it and says the marshal's alive and they see the body of the Pekyu and that gives them all of the strength that they need. Gin Mazoti, Marshal of Dara, was once again commanding the forces of Dara, even as her body began to char and smoke from the powerful currents of silkmotic force. Yikes. And then we go back to Tombanaki. And she sees somebody standing out in the midst of everything that she could swear is Gia. And she flies up to her like, oh, I'm going to get this bitch. I'm going to get her. But when she gets closer, she's like, ooh, I don't, there's no way this is her. This lady does not seem quite right, first of all. And this has to be a trap because why would she be right out here exposed like this? And Tavanaki tells her to yield. And Gia says, or what? My husband is dead. My son has been enslaved. I will never yield to you because I am already dead. And Tamanaki sees smoke and flames leaping around the dais and realizes, okay, this is the trap. This is a trick and backs up. But, and she thinks like, this can't be Gia. Maybe this is some regular human that they have just dressed up to look like Gia, just some rando. And, she starts to pull away and just as she does all of these attendants rush out to get Gia to leave this like death trap that she's standing on and it's a really weird moment did, did Gia intend to I mean obviously she intended to die but I don't know if she intended to be seen if she wanted to have this conversation 
or what was up here. But obviously this I had thought at first when Tom Vanaki sees the smoke that this was going to be an illusion created by um, Rasana, that it was her smoke work. But then there's flames and then there's this other whole thing. And I was like, oh, no, I guess not. So Gia might just have like cracked a little bit, man. Um, Korva crash landed on the deck of one of the last remaining city ships. Nota me cowered at the foot of the giant beast as Korva struggled to catch her breath. Princess, said Nota me, kneeling and touching his forehead, to the deck. Why have you done this? Water flows from high places to low, but people always are seeking to climb from low places to high. What you've done for the Liyuku today will not be forgotten. And she turns to her people and says, rescue as many survivors as you can and prepare for retreat. But the Imperial airships are gone and our ships outnumber theirs. Um, if their army number... But their army number no more than a few hundred and Ginpen himself is undefended. That is surely a trick, said Tom Vanaki. I flew over Ginpen and assaulted it with Korva, but not a single fire brigade even emerged to stop the spreading fire. This can only mean they are laying another trap for us. I won't repeat the mistake of my father's arrogance. I don't buy it. Like she says, oh, this won't be forgotten. And I'm like, mm, yeah, well, I 100% think it will. Um... Ginpen was burning and it truly was undefended, yet the empty city had frightened away the fearless Liyuku princess. What a bonkers, like she really, she could have just, but no, but no. And then to end it all, we get a conversation between the gods. And I really enjoy this, <laughs> that the gods are like, split now because of the multiple forms of worship and are arguing amongst themselves over like whether or not they should have given them the clues about using the silkmotic force um the people of dara are changing brothers and sisters the liyuku are not going away the mortals have to figure out how to deal with this and so do we i hate it when we agree i can't say i would dispute you on that point and that is the end of chapter 60. So the gods are a bit of a mess also. It's a little reassuring to know that can happen to the gods. Um, all right, I'm over time, so I've got to go. Thank you very much again, Kyle, for commissioning this. I can't believe the next episode is the last one for this book. That is so crazy. But I'm looking forward to the next book coming out next year. So yay. All right, everybody. Thank you. And I will see you soon with a new one. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. <laughs>